Good afternoon and welcome to the Macmillan Center, everybody. Uh, Happy New Year. It's great to see you all here. This event today is it's a real uh, pleasure and privilege for me to be introducing it. Uh, I'm Ian Shapiro. I am the director here. Um, this, this is part of a large project that we have going at Yale on the role of business in peace negotiations. We have uh, research being done on uh, the role of business in the South African uh, peace process in 25 years ago. Um, we have the work being done on the role of business in Middle East peace negotiations. We have people who have worked on what business did in the Northern Irish negotiations. But today we, we are very privileged to have a panel on um, the role of business in the in the Havana Accords and in most importantly what comes next. I'm here as a consumer of knowledge, not as an imparter of knowledge today. So uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm about to turn things over uh, to uh, Maria Victoria Llorente, who uh, is um, the, the director of a very important institute in Colombia uh, that is concerned with coming up I with ideas for the peace process. So, welcome. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Professor Shapiro. It's uh, a real honor to be here. And uh, I am supposed to introduce Mr. Sergio uh, Jaramillo. And I have been granted the honor of introducing him before this, uh, this audience. Um, Sergio Jaramillo, uh, who has been the High Commissioner of Peace in Colombia for the past four years. How did Mr. Jaramillo, a philosopher expert in Plato, became Peace Commissioner and moreover the essential actor of the most symbolic and crucial peace process of Colombia of the past three decades? This didn't happen by chance. This didn't happen out of the blues. For the past 15 years, he has been working nonstop with an impe impeccable or better uh, surreal sense of uh, duty, trying to bring lasting peace to Colombia, no more, no less. There's like a sound here. OK. Okay, so in a first moment in the early 2000s, as advisor of the Minister of Defense, he helped draft the policy of democratic defense and security, a pillar of the highly celebrated counterinsurgency campaign promoted during the government of President Alvaro Uribe. In a second, mo in a second moment, Mr. Jaramillo became Deputy Minister of, Def of Defense, being Juan Manuel Santos, uh, now President of Colombia, being Minister of Defense. As such, he made fundamental contributions to the counterinsurgency campaign that ended, ended up bringing the FARC to that negotiating table. I would like to highlight three of those contributions. The first one, the strategy that led hundreds of thousands of combatants to demobilize individually, crushing the guerrilla from within. The second, the policy of territorial consolidation that sought to build state in areas historically dominated by the guerrillas, applying the doctrine of integral action. And third, the human rights policy of the Colombian armed forces in the understanding that legitimacy is their greatest strength. Between these two moments, Mr. Jaramillo, Became, was the head of the think tank I now laid. During this, period, during this period, he contributed to the understanding of the dynamics of the armed conflict in Colombia and reflected on the central role of business in peace building. His public trajectory has been guided by his almost obsessive conviction that the ultimate goal is to consolidate the authority of the state and the rule of law throughout the national territory. The ultimate purpose is to integrate Colombia, that 
All Colombians, regardless of the part of the country where they live, enjoy same, the same rights. This is why the agreement with the FARC not only deals with their demobilization and how they will be made accountable before justice for their, for their crimes. A substantial part of the agreement is devoted to address the roots of the armed conflict, to deepen our democracy, to solve drugs prob the, the drugs problem, and develop and bring to the 21st century the rural area, areas in Colombia. I hope, Mr. Jaramillo, that I have faithfully reflected your career path in search of a stable and lasting peace for our country. Now I give you the floor. Can you hear me? Does it sound okay? Well, so thank you very much, my Victoria, for those very kind words, and thanks to Professor Javier for the invitation, and to Ana Maria Ibanez, and all the friends uh, who are in the audience. Um, I don't know if Professor Owen Fiss is there, um, but I greet him here from Bogotá. I was asked to speak about the challenges of implementation, and who would have thought that precisely the challenges of implementation kept me from traveling to Yale, the president asked me at the last minute to please stay behind because we had a critical meeting with the FARC leadership yesterday out where they're having a, a, a meeting to turn themselves into a political party. We had a critical meeting to um, sort out a deadlock in the DDR process in the movement of the FARC into cantonment areas. Um, and today, we are voting in Congress as we speak. We are voting uh, the most important bill of the process, which is the transitional justice framework. So when I'm done here, I'll have to rush back into Congress, which is where I came from. I am extremely sorry not to be with you, especially as I've never had the privilege of um, uh, being at Yale. But that is what life is like when you are uh, in the middle of a peace process, you become uh, truly a slave. Uh, I had prepared some um, longer remarks, but given that I'm not there with you, I thought that I'd, I'd keep them shorter and leave more time uh, for questions. Now, before I get to the challenges of implementation, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank the U.S. and in particular the outgoing administration for all the support we've had in this process. We had huge support from President Obama. We had huge support from Secretary Perry, who was extraordinarily active and responded to all our demands and sent an excellent and special boy, Bernie Anderson, to work with us. I, I sometimes wonder, when was the last time that the uh, US had success with a, a bipartisan, uh, a program supported with bipartisan support to strengthen a country's institutions, strengthen its security that then ended with a uh, classic peace process to end a 50-year war and get a guerrilla to hand over its weapons. That is actually what is happening in Colombia. So thank you, uh, America. And I want to use the opportunity as well to um, do a small for a year for, uh, for a strategy of engagement, which is what I think that President Obama and Secretary Kerry have done. When you have a very long conflict like ours, or Northern Ireland, or Israel-Palestine, uh, naturally, as you all know, identities tend to fossilize, people see no way out. And in our case, we had a war of 50 years. Uh, but I believe that if you are able to identify a minimal basis of consensus, and that is actually what, of shared interests, which is exactly what President Santos did in 2010, uh, you can actually turn a logic of confrontation into a logic of cooperation. Uh, which is what a peace process is about, at least about the, the, the shared goal. It's not always possible. One can't be naive. There are examples in history, recent history, perhaps in Vietnam, when you have a real negotiation. But I think you should always have a try. Uh, just last week, we had the German foreign minister visiting, and I took him out to one of the cantonment areas where the FARC are going to lay down their weapons. 
And on the plane flying there, he said, well, you know what said is really important about Colombia, apart from the fact that you're finally achieving peace, is the fact that you are showing the world that you can actually have successful peace negotiations. Most people have actually lost faith uh, in negotiations. And negotiations themselves, engagement itself, engenders new opportunities. Uh, suddenly doors open, windows open. What seemed impossible then seems possible later on. Who would have thought uh, three years ago that the FARC would agree to uh, acknowledge and be accountable for the war crimes, that they would uh, agree to, to repair their own, with their own assets, something that no ruler has ever done? Well, that's what that process has made possible. Now, it has not been easy. Uh, it's been extremely tough. We've had, uh, we started after about a year and a half of back channeling. We, we started six months of secret talks in Havana, in Cuba, that ended with uh, a framework agreement that has been the roadmap for the whole process. And then we had four more grueling years of negotiations, but in the end, we had a result. Now, tough as the negotiations were, difficult as they were, they are nothing compared to the difficulties of implementation, of the challenges of turning this piece of paper into something real. There are some obvious challenges, what you can imagine. You will never have enough resources, you don't never have enough money, you have serious limitations in your administrative capacity, in your ability to uh, deliver the results on the ground. I want to focus on, on three or four uh, major challenges, and then I'll put a word about the private sector, which is the theme of the panel. Now, I think the first challenge is to make sure that you actually have a vision, that you know what you are trying to achieve. The answer might seem simple, but you, what you're trying to achieve is implement the agreement. Well, that is actually not so simple, because there are different interpretations and different views. Quite a few people in Colombia still have a minimalist view of the peace process. They think that it's just the DDR process, it's just about the FARC handing over its weapons. We were just having a good discussion in Congress this morning with the political opposition precisely about that. We said, no, it's not about that, just. Or some people have a excessively, I would call it, uh, technocratic view of what the peace process is about and implementation. It's just, you know, you, you reach the agreements and you just go out and implement them. But I think it's much more than that. We've always said that DDR is obviously a necessary condition for peace. If the FARC don't lay down their weapons and uh, reintegrate into civilian life, obviously we don't have peace. But it's not a sufficient condition. We always thought that we had to change what I would call the enabling conditions on the ground that allowed uh, this conflict to last for so long. And that's what we did during the secret phase. We agreed to an agenda, that framework agreement, that aimed precisely at changing those enabling conditions, and therefore we agreed with the FAR to talk about a very limited but very substantial agenda that includes rural development, political participation, the issue of drugs, especially the problem of the coke fields, the issue of DDR, and especially the issue of victims. So the whole logic of this process has been one about ending the historic conflict of Colombia. It's a logic of non-repetition, not simply a logic of agreeing to a DDR process with a particular group. And it's even more than that. I think it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to change a certain path that the country was in to create uh, a momentum that, as Maria Victoria was saying, will promote forces that will help Colombia integrate territorially and as a society that will help us, as a friend of mine, Jim Robinson from Harvard, now at the um, University of Chicago said, reorganize state society relations in those peripheral areas of the country that have suffered the, the conflict. And the key idea here, which I've been talking about now for, for a few years, is what uh, we've been calling, I've been calling the idea of territorial peace. It sounds slightly funny, Nick. but what it means is not simply that you have to make sure that your implementation takes account of the particular nature of each given region, 
especially in a country like Colombia that is so incredibly diverse, um, it means much more than that. It means that you have to have a vision of peace that is truly bottom up and that tries to change the vicious circle of violence that the regions of the country were immersed in into a virtuous circle that leads to true institutional strengthening um, and to protection of people's rights, which is in the end what this whole peace process is about. Because only strong institutions that can challenge and mediate conflicts are going to guarantee us a long and lasting peace. Uh, so that's the vision. What you need to do is to make sure that it's shared. It's a shared vision, and that is a challenge. It's a challenge to make sure that everyone reads from the, shape, from the same sheet of music. We sometimes have problems even with the own government in, in having a shared understanding about what is actually in the Havana Agreement. Now, to make sure that you can actually get that vision going, that it means something, you need to set up a process. And that is the second challenge we have, to really mobilize citizenship around around peace and mobilize it in a methodical and organized way, starting, if you like, in a kind of spiral, working with local communities and work with different participatory planning processes where in a in what you might imagine in standard manner, you don't simply just go and tell people what has been agreed. You say, okay, this is what has been agreed. For example, in, on the issue of um, crop substitution. But we're going to work with you to establish a shared vision of what this region of Colombia is about, uh, a shared view of what the priorities for this region are, and we're going to turn that into concrete plans. And we're going to do that together with you. And to the extent that one does that and then can actually then deliver. I am convinced that you move into you move from this vicious circle of violence into a virtuous circle of institutional strengthening because people see that they, they count, that they have voice, and that they actually that the government responds to their needs and that their priorities are taken into account. And you build trust, which is possibly the most precious good in a peace building process in those uh, far off and peripheral areas of Colombia that for so long have seen government agencies trying to do things without much success. But it's not just about the local communities, it's also about opening spaces, for example, regionally, in the regional capitals, and getting, getting people that never talk to each other, businessmen that never talk to certain social movements or NGOs, or the church or universities to sit at, at one table and discuss the future of that region and help with implementation. I'll go back to that when I talk about the private sector. And then nationally, you also need to find ways to build bridges. It is possibly difficult in the US to imagine the kind of imaginary frontiers that exist in the mind of Colombians. Um, I once gave a talk in Chicago quite, quite a long time ago, about five or six years ago, and I said, look, it's a little bit like if in the mid 19th century somebody in New York thought about the, the West, the Wild West. I mean, it's, it's something on the other side of the Rockies. We don't know much about what's going on there. We just know it's a mess. That's a little bit how people in Colombian cities think about their own country. And what you knew, what you, first thing you need to do is for people to see the reality, to go out there. So part of what we're doing in practical terms is to set up um, programs whereby, for example, students can participate in the various peace building process initiatives, whether they have to do with rural development or transitional justice mechanisms and so forth, and actually be there on the ground and then come fly back home and tell their family what they actually saw. Uh, that is a way of integrating the country as well. Now, the next challenge I won't say much about, but it's exactly what I was dealing with yesterday, which is the issue of, of uh, DDR, because traditionally, uh, armed groups in Colombia have reintegrated in Colombian cities, and Colombia has a strong, the government has a strong institution that does that. But in this case, the FARC, that are a you know, famously rural organization, want to do the reintegration in those rural areas, and they want to do it in a more associative manner by putting together various cooperatives that will guarantee them, guarantee them um, a living 
um, and also an orderly transition into civilian life. And that is a, a big challenge, but at the same time, uh, can you turn into a kind of win-win situation if you, if you get things, as we've tried in this peace process, in a slightly, in a kind of clockwork manner, to dovetail to each other, so that in the, to the extent that you implement the agreements uh, we have on rural development uh, and on crop substitution in alternative development, you create opportunities for reintegration, but at the same time, to the extent that the FARC gets themselves organized uh, with these cooperatives, they can actually themselves promote uh, the implementation of those agreements. So it's a kind of win-win thing if you actually get the right uh, um, structure to dovetail. The next big challenge, which would be a whole chapter, I won't say much about, I have still a standing invitation, very kind invitation from the Yale Law School to go and talk about transitional justice, which I haven't managed to do, because I never, as you see, never get out of either Colombia or Cuba. But the next challenge, naturally, is, is a great issue of transitional justice, which was a massive challenge in the negotiation. It was a true case of square in the circle. You are negotiating with the people who are most responsible for the crimes committed uh, during the conflict, at least in terms of hierarchy. And you have to convince them to set up a system of accountability for those crimes. That's what we had to do, and it was extremely difficult. We did it by putting together what we call a integral or comprehensive system of transitional justice with a special tribunal, with a truth commission, with reparation measures, with a special unit to look after the disappeared. Uh, um, and I can talk more about that during the questions if you're interested. What I wanted to mention now, the immediate challenge, the real world challenge now, is how to coordinate that transitional justice system with the DDR process. Uh, this has been very, very difficult because uh, Colombia is a very, very legalistic country. Uh, in Colombia, this has become the major issue, and also for the FARC. So they say, well, we're going to do this if we know what the conditions are. So the first thing we, we had to do after we finally finished the agreement was pass a bill that grants amnesty for uh, minor crimes. Uh, and what we're now doing is passing another bill to set up this robust transitional justice structure with a special tribunal to judge um, so-called international crimes, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and so forth. And, and there's this interdependence between that process of what you might call legal security and what actually happens on the ground in the DDR process. And that has been really very, very challenging to coordinate. That was one of the things we were trying to do yesterday. And I will finish by mentioning the issue of the, um, the private sector. Now, in Colombia, the private sector historically has been active on issues of reintegration. Uh, in the 2000s, many, many tens of thousands of combatants from the paramilitary militias demobilized. The government set up a special agency to look after the reintegration, and the, the private sector um, uh, came forth and, and helped. But I think what we're facing now is a challenge of a different order of magnitude. As I said at the beginning, it's not simply a DDR process. It's a process that aims at actually changing conditions on the ground in Colombia. That's a great opportunity we have. So we can think more strategically about what the private sector can do. And I will just mention very briefly a few things. Um, the first is, there, there's a fact. In many of, of these peripheral areas of Colombia, some businesses, oil businesses, gas businesses, palm oil businesses, often are institutionally even stronger than the government that has, has a weak presence. On the other hand, if what you're trying to do is to really integrate the country to, as we say in Spanish, institutionalize the, the country, the territory, then that is not just an issue of bringing so-called institutions uh, 
putting them on the ground again as if, as if, as if that were something they could just do from the capital. You can't. And that's what we. That's what I meant by this territorial peace idea. You also need to integrate them economically. There is no way you can actually be successful with the uh, rural development program we agreed to if there are no markets to absorb that production from those small farmers we are hoping to support, or from those people that are trying to get out of uh, poker cultivation. So the role of the, of the private sector here is critical. These are things that governments are not good at. Go governments are not good at marketing, and that's something which should lead to the private sector, but we need to create a structure whereby the private sector is um, appropriately uh, coordinated, articulated with those initiatives. On the issue of DDR, second issue, which I already mentioned, I said that we have this idea with the FARC that they can put together various kinds of cooperatives, for example, small companies to build, to do small uh, roadworks in those peripheral areas, or transport location, or small agricultural projects, and that's something that can be done. But to be successful, because those kinds of projects mostly fail, they need to have uh, somebody from the private sector take them by the hand and walk them along. The FARC have said, for example, they want to build, uh, I mentioned it already, a small company to do uh, roadworks. So why not get an, uh, an engineering company, a serious engineering company, to work with them and to uh, walk them through the steps as to how you can actually do that? That's one of the things we are promoting. Then there is a great and very difficult issue of justice I mentioned already, because this, the comprehensive system we agree to is a farm. So state agents as well, for all who have had a relation or, or a degree of responsibility in the crimes committed during the conflict, and that includes civilians, that includes civilian individuals, and sometimes also private companies. The way we thought about this is that we want to create incentives for those who have responsibility for those crimes that are not the most serious crimes to come forth, to tell the truth, to help with operations, and by doing so, for example, in the context of the Truth Commission, to build trust in those regions, to build better relations within society, and to build a, a, a basis for uh, all the programs we want to put into place. And the, the, the private sector there has a role to play. And finally, um, I think it's extremely important for the private sector to exercise very strong leadership. If we are building peace from the ground up, if we are building, building peace with this territorial model, we need business leaders, especially in the region, to help build consensus, to help um, create a shared vision, as I said before. Now here we have a very big challenge, which is, as many of you may know, we had our own uh, version of Brexit when we lost a popular referendum at the end of September by 60,000 votes out of a, um, almost, a total of almost 14 million. It was about 0.4 of a percentile, but we still lost. And that meant that unlike in the case of Brexit, uh, the message was from those leaders of the, of the no campaign that we should go back to the negotiating table and sort out a series of issues of which they had uh, views and criticisms. And that's what we did. We, were, we struck first at the representatives of the no campaign and we uh, listened to them very carefully. We took notes of all to improve the agreement, and then we went back to Havana and had very, very intense sessions with the FARC, and by the end of November, we had a new version of the agreement that was signed. But the effect, the effect of the popular referendum, as happened in the UK, and perhaps as has happened, if I may say so, now in the US with elections, was to strengthen, to deepen the differences, to strengthen identities into camps, the yes camp and the no camp. And we need to overcome that. I used to think that the precondition for implementation was building a consensus. But I'm now changing my mind. I think that the pre what we need to do is promote implementation, get everyone involved, and by doing that, start building a new consensus 
in Colombian society, and I think the private sector has a critical role in doing that. Thank you very much, and if you want, I'm very happy to answer uh, your questions. Natalia Ariza, uh, I'm originally from Bogotá, and my question for you is, could you elaborate on the qualifications you made um, from the version prior to October 2nd to the end of November? I understand that time is limited, but I would appreciate some high-level summary of what those changes look like. So it, it, it broke up, could you repeat the question? Yeah, uh, the question is uh, if you could uh, briefly elaborate on the differences between uh, the first uh, accord and the second one after uh, the, the one that was uh, endorsed uh, on November. Yes, okay. Um, well, first a few details, uh, a few more details about the process because it was a peculiar thing. I mean, we really were in a very difficult situation. Um, it, it was a risk inherent to the idea of a popular referendum. Uh, some, some people say, well, you were crazy to hold a popular referendum to end the war. You simply end the war, which sounds sensible. But at the same time, given that there were major reforms that had been reached, we always thought that if you wanted to have a democratic support for them, you had to put them to the people. Now, those who voted no, at least the, the, the leaders of that campaign, said, no, we're not against peace. What we have is a series of criticisms of the agreement. Uh, so the first thing we did was to sat, sit with them for many, many hours at the Ministry of the Interior for almost about a week non-stop, and we took note of all the points, and we discussed them with them. Uh, and we thought that many of them were things that we could possibly get the far to agree with. There were some structural things that we couldn't change, because an agreement is in the end a package deal. So, for example, no guerrilla has ever signed a peace agreement uh, to be sent to prison. It doesn't happen. With, with, with the system we have, uh, you, you pay if you commit a very serious crime, uh, um, you serve a sentence in particular conditions, you are not free to go wherever you like, you have to do a, a series of reparations and so forth, but you don't, you don't do this in a prison. So it's more dignified and it serves the ends of the peace process. That is, if you tell the truth. If you don't, you are sent to prison. That is just one example. But on the whole, uh, we, we, we thought of uh, quite a few things we could work on. Come back to the FARC and said, look, uh, we lost the referendum on the plebiscite, and we need to look at this proposal seriously. And that's what we did. And in the end, we actually managed to persuade the FARC um, against what we actually thought to agree to a very, very large percentage of those changes. Now, what did they involve, which is the question? Uh, uh, on the issues of rural development, they had to do mostly with guarantees. Um, some people thought the language of the agreement was too ambiguous. Some people thought that uh, private property was at risk. Uh, we, we never thought that was the case. But uh, we managed to put language in to give enough guarantees that things would be done according to the constitution and current law and so forth. Um, on the issue of uh, transitional justice, things were more difficult because 
there were many objections to the idea of a special tribunal, and people wanted to see more clearly what the relation would be between that special tribunal, that jurisdiction, and the ordinary Colombian courts. So we made there quite a few changes to fine tune the relation between the transitional justice institutions and program and the working of the ordinary courts in Colombia. And that entailed many, many changes. Also, with regard to what the FARC has to do, we, we were much more precise um, about the conditions that, uh, under which they're going to serve their sentences. Um, I mentioned at the very beginning reparations. We had general language about reparations, but with the new agreement, the FARC committed in writing to repair their own victims with their own assets. Um, on the issue of implementation and verification, uh, which is, as you know, an extremely important uh, critical for the success of the peace process, we also improved many things uh, about how the international verification system is going to work, what the relation to the various pieces are, and in the end, uh, as I said, I think we managed to uh, meet about uh, by our count, about 95% of the concerns of those representatives of the no campaign. Okay, we, we have time for two more questions, please. There's an, uh, I'll take that one there, and then you all I don't know if it's easier for you to get that mic over there. Yeah, that's a little uh, Hello. Um, you, this is a very successful, obviously, uh, peace process, and will become milestones for the future. What are the things about the process that you think are the most transportable to future uh, these processes? And what are the, obviously everything is different and every area is different, but what are the key things that you would recommend uh, that were the most successful to bring you to the future and uh, solving other you know, long-standing peace issues? Well, thank you very much. That is, that is first of all, a very large question. And, and second of all, one that wants to, one that wants to answer with a, a big dose of humility, because we still have to see how things work out here. Also, we, we made a huge effort. Uh, I made a big effort myself, as perhaps also Maria Victoria said, for uh, not just now, over the last six years that I've been engaging with the peace process, but over the last 10 or 15 in trying to draw lessons from other parts of the world. We also had the benefit of having people who work seriously on peace process in other countries to come and advise us on a permanent basis. I would mention especially uh, Jonathan Powell, the former chief of staff of Tony Blair, who was responsible for most of the Northern Ireland agreement, uh, was with us most of the time. Joaquin Villalobos, who was a Salvadorian guerrilla that negotiated in uh, 1990, was with us, uh, and others, the years from Harvard, so many, etc. So we tried to do as much as we could to, to learn from others. What do we think that worked? It's a long answer, but quickly told, I think that a, a, a critical piece was the idea of doing secret negotiations to arrive at a framework agreement so that everyone knew what the peace process was about. We couldn't afford, in Colombia, failure. We had already three major peace processes that had failed, one in the 1980s, one in the early 90s, and a very traumatic one in the late 90s, early 2000s, that ended in nothing. So President Santos understood that we couldn't afford failure. We had to be very careful and go step by step. And the way to do that was first to use a back channel, very intensely, for about a year and a half, and then to sit with the FARC in a safe house in Havana and say, OK, this is our vision of peace, what is yours? These are the things we are willing to talk about because they are related to the end of the conflict. We're not prepared to talk about any, any issue in the national agenda, we're prepared to talk about these things. And in the end, they agreed to that. And the president in September of 2012 gave a major speech and surprised the whole country with the fact that we had already an agreement in our hands and that this whole thing had not leaked, which is more or less a miracle in Colombia, which is a, a, a media crazy country. So I think this idea that you first do uh, 
uh, you know, so-called talks about talks that everyone is clear about what the process is going to be about, and then you launch it, was was a major part of the success. Um, one of the things that I mentioned, I think the president, after we finished the, the piece, the secret talks, put together or strengthened considerably the the negotiating team, brought in a former vice president. As, as head of the delegation, a, 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 a heavyweight politician, a, a brilliant man, Humberto Lacalle, uh, who was fabulous, brought in uh, a former commander of the armed forces and a former director of the police, so that the key and, and a major representative of business, talking about the private sector, so that the major stakeholders all felt that they were represented uh, at the same table. And especially as the process developed and we got to the delicate issues of ceasefires and weapons, we created a special subcommission to deal with those issues where serving officers, for the first time ever, serving officers of the Colombian military and the police um, sat and under our umbrella negotiated with the FARC. And that was also um, a very important pillar that, of the process that has given its stability. And as a result of that, we agreed to a quite an original mechanism to do the, the monitoring and verification of the ceasefire, which we call the tripartite monitoring and verification mechanism, where you have the FARC guerrillas trained as monitors, our own officers, army and police officers, <laughs> and the UN officers that come from most countries in Latin America and some European countries, working together, doing joint monitoring on the ground together, living together. The German foreign minister that I mentioned a while back uh, was uh, shocked and pleased at the same time to see how after such a bitter war, you go into one of those areas, those zones, where this joint monitoring mechanism is working, and you find the army officer wearing the same vest as the UN officer, as the guerrilla, all working together. So all those have been, become trust-building uh, uh, mechanisms. And I could mention a, a few more, but I, I, I will stop with those. If one of the things, if I ever get out of this job, I'll have to sit down and do is think about harder about what makes this work. I didn't hear the last part of how that could apply or not apply to um, semi-autonomous indigenous reserves and also Afro-Colombian um, Oh yes, okay. Well, no, no, good question. Uh, <coughs> we have the we have the president of France, Hollande, visiting next week, and we're going to take himself take himself out to one of the zones, and precisely we picked one where, where there are very very strong indigenous communities. No, what we did. Uh, this is a very uh, moving moment of the whole peace process because what the issue of participation was always a serious issue and a difficult issue to to deal with because we had to guarantee citizens participation but you cannot have too many people at a negotiating table otherwise you make no progress it's just too difficult so what we did was to organize a series of conferences in Colombia during the process so for each point for example, rural development with the help of the UN and the major public university in Colombia, the Universidad Nacional, we will organize a major conference where 1,500 people will attend and make proposals that will reach Havana. We do that for each point. Um, in the case of victims, we went even much further. We will organize for delegations of victims to travel to Havana that's another, po that's another point that I should have added to what made this process work, was taking victims seriously and making them participate and taking their interests seriously. 
But in the case of the uh, Afro-Colombians and the indigenous communities, they said, no, 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 that's not good enough for us. We insist that there has to be a special chapter in the agreement about us. Turns out that uh, the indigenous communities in Colombia and the Afro-Colombian communities probably have the strongest uh, constitutional rights in the Americas. There's very, very developed uh, jurisprudence in Colombia to protect their rights, and they were quite worried about what would happen. So the very last day of the negotiations in September, when we finished with the first version of the agreement, they all turned up in Havana. And they said, no, 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 you cannot finish this negotiation without us. So we said, OK, let's sit down, but we only have a day. So we sat down with them, and we wrote up six or seven pages of what is called the ethnic chapter of the agreement, where all the institutions that exist today to deal with their interests and issues uh, are used as kind of filters for all the things we had agreed to. And if we you mix that with the fact that we are committed to a bottom-up peace-building uh, process, then I think that their participation is more than guaranteed. In fact, when we were explaining the uh, agreement to the Colombian people in September and went out, I myself went all around the country and where I found perhaps the strongest support apart uh, naturally from students and universities was amongst the indigenous and Afro-Columbian communities. I, assist, I went to a meeting in Cauca in southern Colombia were under a single roof. There were 7,000 indigenous people sitting there listening carefully, trying to understand what the agreement was, whether it would impinge their rights and bring them peace. And at the end, they said, this is the most important meeting we've ever had in, in this place. So um, we've had very strong support with it from them, and we hope to work very closely with them now in the implementation phase. Sergio, this is Ana Maria. Thank you very much for the presentation and for the generous time that you have provided us. Uh, the best of luck uh, with your conversations now with the Congress. And now we're going to move to the private sector panel. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Ana Maria. Let me just say again very, very briefly how sorry I'm not to be with you. Um, uh, but thank you, thank you, Professor Shapiro. And I now have to run, run back and see if we get the, the vote in Congress. Thank you. Bye bye. So I'm going to very briefly introduce the, the private sector panel, uh, which is one of the main topics that brings us here. Uh, and first, I would like to acknowledge Professor Shapiro and the Macmillan Center for organizing this, this event. Uh, in Colombia, we really need to discuss ways to move forward. Uh, the peace process was successful. We have a peace agreement, but the country is under a heavy uh, political polarization, and we need to find ways uh, to work together as a society. So Colombia, as Sergio said, has faced a complex conflict since 1964. In 2006, we had the demobilization of the paramilitary groups, and in 2016, we just had the, sig the, the, the mobilization or the signature of the peace agreement with the FARC. It, and although the end of the conflict is nearby, we have two lingering threats that are still present. The ELN, which is another left-wing guerrilla group, is still operating in the territory. And second, the illegal coca production has again expanded in many regions of Colombia, uh, bringing, as always, violence upon the population. Uh, the impact of the conflict was immense. The official number of victims is around 8.3 million people, while the number of internally displaced people is around 7.4 million, which is about 15% of the Colombian population. And the challenges of implementing the peace agreement are significant. So let me just give you some figures before introducing the, the, the panel so that you have in your mind when you're doing the discussion. Uh, for example, poverty rates in Colombia in 2015 were 27.8% with a very large rural-urban gap. 
In the urban areas, it was 24%, while in the rural areas, it was 40%. And it's in the rural areas where, as Sergio Jaramillo said, the peace agreement is going to be implemented. The inequality of the country is high and is pervasive. The Gini coefficient today is 0 0.52, which is the highest in Latin America, which is one of the most unequal regions of the world. In 2016, we were very happy with the unemployment rate, which was in the 15-year lowest, but it was 7.6%. Uh, and half of the workforce is still in the informal sector. And when we think about the agreement uh, being implemented in the rural areas, the rural areas of Colombia have several problems. They have been dislocated from the productive centers of the country, and it, they have a lot of social and economic problems. Access to land, which is the main productive input in the country, is uh, low. Only 42% of, of the rural population has access to land. And most of this access is completely informal, so half of the people that have access to land do so under informal uh, agreements. Land property is highly concentrated, so the Gini coefficient for land is 0 0.89, uh, which means that the top 1% of the landowners concentrate 43% of the total hectares of the country. The rural areas are uh, very poorly equipped for productive activities. We, don't ha we have poor infrastructure, low provision of public goods, and little access to financial capital. And the central and local governments have been vastly ineffective and unwilling, and I really underscore the unwilling, to promote the transformation of the Colombia's rural areas. So the pre the pre process really provides an interesting opportunity. Uh, but what we need to ask ourselves whether the government and the society is really willing to transform this opportunity into better conditions for millions of people in Colombia. Or will we face yet again a broken promises as several times it has happened in the country, and it happened several times during the 20th century. So today what we're going to discuss is what's going to be the role of the private sector to support these uh, transformations. We have three very important uh, leaders from the private sector and from big, large, important countries, <coughs> companies of the conflict. We have Carlos Enrique Cabellier. He is CEO of Alqueria, which is one of the largest Colombia's dairy producers. Uh, he combines an extensive experience with the private sector, with experience on the public se sectors. He has worked in the Ministry of Justice, in the Ministry of Agriculture. He has also been a congressman in the state legislature of Cundinamarca. He was professor for seven years in the School of Management of Universidad de los Andes, and he has a BA, interestingly, in anthropology and sociology, and an MPA from Harvard University. Alqueria is a dairy, dairy uh, production firm which is 58 years old, is one of the largest of the country. Uh, and it has a strong presence in rural areas in Colombia. And it works especially with small, medium, and large producers of, of dairy. Uh, it has a long tradition of investing in social programs, especially targeted to small farmers, to, to children, and to adolescents, providing scholarships for uh, rural underprivileged children. And lately, and in addition, it has designed a program called MACA to reach dairy farmers in previously conflict areas and connecting them to the markets. We also have Antonio Celia. Antonio Celia is the CEO of Promigas. Promigas, again, is a very important and large company in Colombia. It provides, supplies 50% of the natural gas in the country. Uh, he's president also of the board of directors of, of Nutresa, which is the largest leading processed food company in Colombia, and is in the board of directors of several uh, companies. He is, has been very active uh, creating and being the president of the board of directors of two important organizations from the civil society. One is Empresarios por la Educación, which is basically a company that promotes uh, programs to improve public and private education in Colombia. And also he leads the Private Council for Competitiveness, which is a company that seeks an association to promote the dialogue between the public and private sector in order to improve Colombia's competitiveness. He's an engineer 
from Worcester Polytechnic Institute of Massachusetts, and he has graduate studies from MIT and Wharton School of Business. Promigas is a holding energy corporation that has 18 companies in Colombia and Peru. As I say, it supplies 50% of the gas of the country. It has provides gas to 3.4 million households, and it serves can, uh, households from all the income spectrum in Colombia. In Colombia, gas supply is large. 62% of the families use gas. And they also have a very interesting foundation <coughs> that is called the Fundación Promigas that promotes educational programs in the country with a strong emphasis on measuring and doing impact ev evaluation of, of the results of the program. The foundation has received several awards and recognitions for its social programs. Mm -hmm. And they have two important uh, specific programs for peace building. The first one is a program for promoting entrepreneurship of former ex-combatants and a solar energy project in former FARC regions. The third speaker is Silvia Escobar. She is the CEO of the Organización Terpel, which is a very large company that provides oil and gas throughout the country, and it's the third largest company in Colombia. She has extensive experience on the private sector, but also, and very importantly so, in the public se sector. She worked in the Ministry of Finance and in the Ministry of Planning of the country, so she's able to, to be in both worlds. And that's important. She has a bachelor's, de bachelor's degree in economics from Universidad de los Andes in Colombia and studied econometrics in La Sorbonne in Paris, France. And she is one of the most important women leaders from the private sector in Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> Terpel is are one of the largest distributors of fuel in Colombia. They have operations in Peru, Colombia, Mexico, Ecuador, and Dominican Republic and Panama. And they have service stations all over the country. So they have been suffering the effects of conflict for many, many years. Uh, they have a lot of social programs at, at, as well, aimed specifically to peace building, uh, for providing economic opportunities to former ex-combatants. They have an employability program. They have trade fairs for entrepreneurs, for them to provide their goods and to sell them goods, uh, and investment in income generating uh, programs. Also, they have one volunteering programs in which all the people from Terpel work with former ex-combatants to build school together and to, to help schools uh, move forward. So we have a high level panel. Basically what we will do is that we will have a discussion among ourselves uh, for 10 minutes. Uh, then we will have comments from Maria Victoria Llorente and Chris Tonell. I will introduce them later. And uh, then we will have, if we have time, we will open the discussion from the floor. So the first question that I would wanted to ask you is, uh, I want, to, you, want you to briefly mention the social programs that you have in your companies. I skip through them, but I think it's important for the public to know which are the social programs that you have that you work uh, to, for peace building, and especially concentrating in what Sergio said, because most of your programs are based on urban areas, uh, hiring ex-combatants and working with ex-combatants, and this new peace agreement poses a new challenge, which is how are we going to incorporate these people, given that these people are going to be in the rural areas of, of the country. So, Silvia, why don't you start and then we go. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for being here at this time. Um, we, we, we are very excited to be here and be telling you all about the Did she hit a button? She turned everything off. She did? Well, once you hit that, it kills everything. Uh, no problem. Um, so I was telling you about uh, what, what we are doing now, and more important than that, what we are thinking that we have to do. Um, Ana Maria asked me to, to tell you about the programs we had before the peace agreement. We used to only have, and this is, I have to say, thanks to Maria Victoria and all the work that she's been doing with the foundation because we changed a lot what we thought about our social uh, importance after 
the peace treaty. So beforehand, we worked in education, and we're still working in it, and we believe that education is the most important thing that anyone <coughs> can do in Colombia to really change the conditions and to really uh, change what the future will be for our country. However, uh, we decided that we were going to separate a new program, and we called it Reinstalling Dreams. And reinstalling dreams because I really think that in Colombia eh, we stop thinking about a good future. We stop trusting that we could do a better country eh, while we were in this 50-year war with the FARC. And eh, so this, this new treaty has, has brought to our country like the possibility to think ourselves in the future, which was something that what we lost for many years. So that is why we call it reinstalling dreams. And in this reinstalling dreams, we have what Ana Maria mentioned about employability and about procurement. Procurement was the second thing we did after just receiving people that were uh, getting out, not only of the guerrilla groups, but also paramilitary groups. So we received all these people, and then we thought that it was not only employability that was important, but uh, the, the, uh, that people could have the opportunity to make their own companies and be our provider. So that was the second thing that we decided to do. But more than that, and what I told you about the future, is that we think that we have to share our knowledge and the things that we do with these rural sectors and these territories that we have all around Colombia. Uh, as Ana Maria mentioned also, uh, we are in, I don't know, 95% of the municipalities in, in, in Colombia. So we really are making a presence in, in, in all the territory, which is very complex in Colombia. So what we are deciding to do, and this we are not doing still, is participating in civil societies, um, building like uh, small places where we can teach people uh, lots of things that we, that we know as, I don't know, how to employ someone, how uh, to work in Excel, how to, things that are very, very, simple but are very necessary to reinstall a new way of living. So that is, that is like the, the part of re reinstalling. The part of participating is very important. In Colombia, eh, all, I, no, I wouldn't say all, but most of the companies, private sector companies, do not participate. They never participate in like social spaces and participation spaces. We think that that <coughs> is, I don't know, for communists and for indigenous and for, yeah. And uh, that is really something that we have to change because if we don't participate in the social s uh, spaces, they will be taken by other people and it's very important that we defend productivity and that we defend everything that democracy has stand for for many years in Colombia. Uh, I think we will have more time to speak now. Uh, so, so I will tell well, uh, Antonio and um, and Carlos Enrique. Tony, my friend. <laughs> I'm, uh, Tony, my, my friend. My, <laughs> my boss. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I, I uh, have to say that the reason uh, why we are here is that, that because we believe in this process, I think it's the first time I have to say because uh, with the polarization that we have in the country, uh, not all the entrepreneurs are being supported in the process in Colombia. Uh, Carlos Cavalier, Silvia Escobar, and me, uh, we have been uh, supporting, promoting, and talking about the benefits of the peace process in Colombia. Uh, we suffer very much. I, in our case, just to give you a, an idea of the context, uh, we own close to 3,000 kilometers of pipeline all over the country. We had 26 bomb attacks between 1997 and 2002. Uh, 
so we cannot forget uh, that one simple example of infrastructure being attacked by guerrillas, both ELN and FARC. Uh, sometimes memory is short, and we tend to forget what happened in the past in Colombia. We suffered. People suffered too much, especially in rural areas. And uh, we're helping, again, because we do believe in this, and we are conducting, at the moment, two uh, projects. One in Soledad Atlantico, this is a uh, um, location near Barranquilla, the city where we have our headquarters, <laughs> with all type of social difficulties, all type of social difficulties. Uh, what we're doing there is we are, are working with the Reintegration Agency of Colombia, and we picked 200 people, former ex, former FARC, and we're teaching them to develop their own uh, micro companies. Uh, we were working initially with uh, psychological uh, support uh, and all what is required uh, for a person that's been in the guerrilla for many years. Uh, these are 200 uh, pilot or persons we're trying with to see whether we can develop uh, productive enterprises. Uh, w the first thing that we they have to learn is this is to make money. This is very important. Uh, and I want to remark here the importance of the private sector, the private investment. Because market economy is winning. <coughs> market economy is the way, even though we have inequalities, we have to reduce them through taxes or through social uh, investment. But they have to be sustainable, so we have to make money with the companies that we create. Uh, we began one year ago. So far, results are very good. They are in a very positive attitude, and hopefully that will work. And the second one is uh, uh, we are working perhaps in the worst area in Colombia, Ana Maria, uh, Caloto Cauca. Cauca is been the center of all type of conflicts for 150 years, guerrillas, paramilitares, drugs, uh, uh, all type, all type of problems. And what we're trying to do is to make money again, make money in a decent manner. Make this is not social assistance. This is not philanthropy. We do that in, in our foundation, but this to learn and teach how to make money with solar panels in the houses in Caloto Cauca in association with FARC. We are developing, installing the first uh, panels. Uh, these are not connected areas with electricity. 1,600 small towns in Colombia do not have electricity service. Uh, many of them, or some of them, are in this area of Cauca near Caloto, so we're trying to <coughs> Uh, have a kind of a joint venture with between FARC and our company in that area to develop solar energy systems all over these uh, small towns. When I uh, told this to Professor Shapiro some months ago that we met in Cartagena, he told me, "Are you? would you be willing to associate with FARC? I said, yes. Uh, we, we're trying to see whether we can do, we can do this. And the other uh, work that we're developing uh, this is through Fundacion Promegas, is uh, we're very concerned with education. Uh, education, in my opinion, is everything. Latin America is behind, except for Chile, in all the uh, indexes of education, especially in PISA, which is like the main indicator of quality of education in the world. Colombia went up two notches in the last uh, in the last, uh, the last PISA uh, <coughs> test. However, dispersion is huge, and there is a enormous difference between rural education and urban education and public education and private education. Here you have private urban education, and here you have rural public education. We are making uh, emphasis in improving rural education in uh, 128 communities <coughs> to rise their level. Uh, we already have uh, proven results, and uh, education takes time, 
and the time of the of education timing is different to political time. Uh, that's why social uh, uh, civil society has to be pushing all the time and uh, requesting uh, the local uh, government to provide good education. Um, and then I, I think that one of the challenges that uh, we have besides all these problems uh, in, in which we are involved and, and I think that, that they will help, uh, not for its size I itself, because they're not, these are not big problems, however they, they could become big because these are pilot plans, is for the uh, demonstration effect. Is uh, The message is we can show you how we can make money if together better uh, and, and, and sustain a, a project of life and have a better future. But the big challenge, in my opinion here, is that we have to help to build a more effective state. A more effective state that has presence in all rural areas and have the real <coughs> monopoly of law and order. Uh, one of the reasons of guerrillas in Colombia, uh, according to experts, is the absence of state in all its manifestation. So we have the challenge of make it more effective. Uh, to that matter, there is a very interesting document uh, published by Corporación de Fomento. I don't know if you know it, maybe you know, you know it. All the other uh, The title is How to Build a More Effective States. <coughs> and that's a challenge, uh, not only for Colombia, but especially for Colombia, but for Latin America in general, with certain exceptions. And again, if the implementation will be successful, if we are able to build a more effective state. An effective state is that, that not only design the public policy, but implements efficiently <coughs> the public policy and learn in that process. I think that's why the private sector has a very important role to play here. And again, remarking the importance of the private investor for economic growth, which is very, very important. Um. Oh, he's here. Sorry. Um, Antonio is also my boss. Yes, uh, <laughs> we worked together in the foundation of for uh, entrepreneurship, and that's what we used to do before. Uh, we did education work uh, with rural children uh, to ameliorate uh, their coming as ATs and getting into college uh, on the privileged children, and. Uh, ameliorate the conditions of schools and towns uh, so that the overall system of education gets better. In the second instance, we do a lot of work at food banks. And we have a lot of returns from milk that we used to uh, uh, use in the business to feed uh, our cows. And now uh, we can give it to food banks um, and use it in perfect conditions for people who are uh, undernourished and in low income um, groups in, in cities, especially children and er elderly. Um, our work uh, with uh, the peace process came after a suggestion from uh, Sergio uh, in a meeting that was uh, held about nine years ago. We had just left the Minister, the Vice Minister of Justice of, uh, of uh, uh, um, uh, Defense, and he was trying to ask companies to come and help with the constellation area of Macarena, uh, which is the area where the FARC had been traditionally for there for 50 years. Uh, and the government had taken away uh, militarily a lot of the area. And they needed um, people to come in and or companies to come in and help um, transform the economy, which is really was very much into coca. And uh, there was uh, farmers we produce five or ten thousand liters a day, and we came in, and in two years, uh, it became six thousand liters of the, uh, uh, a day of, of milk, and we collected uh, milk from uh, fifteen hundred families that didn't have their milk collected before or didn't produce that milk. Um, and the way that happened is that uh, let me regress a little. I Three years ago, 
I was I was uh, when I was a state senator in Colombia. We we organized a a, a trip to visit the FARC, which is not um, it was back then the, the ceasefire with the uh, with the court. Uh, a lot of people flew into on helicopters and visited them and talked to them. Uh, we had to go by donkey, uh, three days on the Florida mountains. Uh, but it was uh, a beautiful experience to see what the geography is, uh, uh, geography that and how they live and how uh, in the FARC and the middle of the um, Andean mountains and the beginning of the Amazon jungle. Um, and understand the livelihood and, and the, the places where they lived and the way they camped out for so many years. Um, and then the uh, year, um, the next year in 1988, I lost the election. So I was uh, taken in um, as a government employee at the Minister of Agriculture. And I got to see the same region from the government eyes. How um, the government didn't work uh, in credit, didn't work in seeds, didn't work in um, technical assistance. And uh, that become became a joke that we used to uh, understand that how the coca leaves work because the government didn't give the credit, uh, didn't give the technical assistance, didn't um, um, guarantee the purchase of the of crops. But the but the um, the, the kingpins of uh, drugs did did all those things. They gave them the, the money. They gave them the credit assistance. They gave. They guaranteed the purchase of the of the, cro of the coca leaves, and the business worked beautifully. So uh, when Sergio invited us to come, I said, "Well, I know how this thing works. You really have to understand that uh, you have to do everything that has to be done there." And Sergio was saying that uh, we are more uh, the same as happens with um, Promigas or Chapel. We're the state in some parts of those two regions. Because uh, nobody's organized over there, and we provide a lot of things that the state doesn't, and we understood that early, and that's how we grew so fast and so many families, and we um, buy about seven million, uh, seven or eight million dollars a year of milk into an area that didn't have that amount of cash coming in and out, um, and what happened? Uh, what we did was two very little things that nobody did before. We came in every day with truck, with tanks, with uh, uh, truck tanks, and pick up the milk. And every two weeks, we send the check out. And that had ne never happened before, because uh, everything that happened in those areas was informal. So people came in for the milk. One day, the other didn't come. The other day, didn't come. The third day, may maybe they came. The fourth day, they came. The, the, they came. The fifth day, they came late. The seventh day, they didn't come. And the payments were the same. Sometimes they paid, sometimes they paid half the milk. Uh, and sometimes they disappeared with, with the money from the farmers that they owed. So um, they were not really connected to the <coughs> urban economy. And now they are. Uh, and for us, it was in a way simple because there was a, a militarily uh, control. And we had some troubles here and there, but not major, major troubles. And, uh, <coughs> we've been buying milk for almost 10 years. Um, and uh, we had maybe uh, 10 days of trouble here and there, uh, or routes that you can get out. And um, so we understood a lot of the processes that um, uh, happens and a lot of the ideas that uh, Sergio was mentioning. Um, Especially one that is very critical about Colombia is that um, <coughs> there are two Colombians, the informal one and the formal one, and the uh, for the rural or for the agri agricultural products, the rural areas the um, will st start uh, after the city um, stops, and it's totally informal or almost totally informal, and the rules and for informality that I just mentioned is how they work. So you go out 10 miles out of Bogota, 20 miles out of Bogota, and there are people in poverty uh, of the 40% that Ana Maria was talking about. Um, and you see the city, and you come into the city, and the city is a city where it works uh, sometimes as a second world, not third world. Uh, 
they have electricity, they have um, formal transportation, uh, Wi-Fi, um, supermarkets, and you got in super, uh, to the town 20 miles out, and then you find yourself with different Colombia. Uh, one of the best descriptions I've heard of Colombia is that we're an archipelago of cities in a sea of, uh, again, taking the words that said he was using the Wild West. What you enter the city and things are safe, uh, they're modern, they work like anywhere else in the world, and then you go out there and well now it's safer, but the rest of the things uh, are very much in the disorder that we've known them for 150 years. Okay, I, I would like to ask another uh, very different question. And it's about the strong political polarization that we have. And this may weaken significantly the peace <coughs> process and the, the implementation of the peace process. And the private sector has been historically adamant to assume political you, the three of you support the peace process, uh, you said it publicly. Uh, but I would like to ask you whether the private sector would be willing to become a more vocal supporter of the peace process. We really need additional leaders besides the government and, and the politicians that have supported the peace process. And the, and the private sector can really have a, a strong and a leadership role in this process. Crystal is going to talk about that uh, uh, about South Africa, and I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, you're right. I think that uh, that's very important. Uh, we we part of uh, half of the entrepreneurs. I can I think that I, I that of uh, all the entrepreneurs in Colombia or the big entrepreneurs in Colombia, half of them. Do not agree with this. Half of us, we are here and we do this on a permanent basis, not only here in Colombia, everywhere. Uh, le let me tell you uh, two things. We try, and this is public now, we try to reach agreements between Centro Democratico and the government. We spend hours and hours and hours try to close the gaps and at some moment in December 7 last year we thought that we were very close to reach an agreement uh, the idea behind that was a simple concept of a uh, pact or basic accords on fundamental issues for the society even though you do not agree in some other uh, matters but if you reach agreements on basic things like security, justice, education, uh, I think that a society could be better off. And if we understand our adversary is not our enemy, that could help in, in the, the idea of, of trying to, to uh, uh, reach points of encounter. So we did uh, uh, a job on that, Ana Maria. Uh, we work uh, hardly. Uh, at the end of the day, I mean, there is a political consideration here that is beyond our understanding or rationality, if you can, if rationality exists, uh, to determine what is the right decision for the country or not. Uh, we have been publicly you know, uh, um, announcing or telling or speaking louder our position. and. Uh, Recently, we created the Private Council for Sustainable Peace. Uh, this uh, council was created two months ago, and uh, with the uh, um, approval of the government, uh, this is a group of <coughs> universities, association of entrepreneurs, and think tanks like uh, uh, Maria Victoria's FIP, we uh, want to um, follow up the implementation process in Colombia. And uh, we're going to start our meetings next week with uh, the post-conflict uh, minister, Rafael Pardo. And the idea is that uh, we have a lot of 
knowledge, I think, and uh, willingness to make the implementation, to do the implementation work well. And I think that's a very powerful message, Ana Maria, in, in my opinion, uh, that a group of uh, private institutions uh, gets together with the Colombian government to make sure that the implementation of the process work well. So I think this uh, is the first time you hear this name, but I hope you will be hearing from it uh, many times. The Private Council for Sustainable Peace with the acceptance again of Sergio Jaramillo and the President Santos himself. I would add, Ana Maria, um, absolutely we are willing uh, to support the peace process. I absolutely believe that forgiveness is something that is absolutely necessary in Colombia. And, uh, and there is a, uh, this phrase that I, I love a lot is from this a priest that's been working a lot in reconciliation and he always says, forgiveness does not change the past, but it absolutely changed the future. And uh, we believe that more than for forgiveness that we have to do with the FARC and Pala Militari and all the kinds of, of uh, people that we have uh, inside the government, we need to have that because as Antonio says, this is irrational. I mean, this is just personal. It, <coughs> it, it goes beyond any political thing. So uh, reconciliation's got to happen inside uh, this political two positions which are really just personal right now. And um, and Terpel, and as Antonio says, we are going to support absolutely the the council and, and are willing to have great results from that. There's, there's no question that we support the process and we have to go way out. I've, I've asked Minister Pardo how many hectares of the 200,000 can we take in it for milk and do the MACA process, really a pilot, and do lots of milk coming out of, of farmers, uh, which shouldn't be too difficult. The question is, um, there was an article uh, by Fernando Cepeda a few weeks ago, and he was citing a um, conversation that Zhu and Lai had with um, Kissinger in the 70s when he was trying to uh, uh, <coughs> approach um, China and the United States. And Zhu and Lai said, we don't, understand, we don't understand you Americans because politics is about positions. You're too pragmatic. You just get you know business here and there, and this is what happens in politics, that people take positions and they keep the positions, like military positions. And uh, giving up positions doesn't seem very normal for us because it, we, uh, in business we need to have transactions uh, for bettering people's livelihoods. So that's kind of what happens in Colombia. People are taking positions uh, on the government side and on the Central Democratico, and uh, they become in a civil position. So how we, we can make a role to that, those positions become less unstable and less fixed, and uh, we can understand that, uh, that we have a, can have a conversation about processes. Uh, the, the success of this uh, private council for uh, sustainable peace will depend on the space, or the op yeah, the space that we uh, receive from the from the local government. But again, I think they have to understand. People in general have to understand uh, the importance of the of the private sector, uh, because again, we need that the economy works well and, uh, and everybody does better. Worked as an associate researcher at the Centro de Desarrollo Económico of Universidad de Los Andes at the Department of Economics. We were neighbors. <laughs> uh, she did a BA of Political Science from the Universidad de Los Andes. Cristonel uh, is uh, at the, from South Africa. She is uh, a business and program director of EMBA and IMBA. 
Right now, he's an assistant professor on leadership in the Nair Rooney University. And he, she, he is visiting lecturer at the University of Stellenbosch Business School. But very importantly so, and for our case in Colombia and for the three of you, during the 1980s in South Africa, he brought together more than 100 CEOs uh, and several hundred managers in South Africa to form the consultative business movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and the purpose of this movement was really to unite uh, business leaders uh, around the challenge of apartheid and work for a democratic future for, for South Africa. And so I think uh, he can provide very interesting comments, experiences, and lessons learned for, for us and for the country. So Maria Victoria, why don't you go ahead and then please. Good evening. Uh, it, it's an amazing story that I've heard, very, very inspiring. And I just want to pick out one or two or a few of the, the lessons that we learned and also looking at it within the context where it seems to me with, with inadequate information, since Ian uh, invited me here, I've been studying up on, on the challenges facing your country, and I see many similarities with South Africa, but I also see some, some very real differences. The context of the 1980s in South Africa was that we had a very oppressive apartheid government with racist legislation, and we had a strong uh, anti-apartheid movement but inside the country, it never achieved the type of military impact that, that I can see and hear occurred in your country. Outside of the country, there was an a armed struggle, but uh, it didn't have that real impact in the country. At that stage, you had the white-dominated government, or white government on the one side, and the essentially black mass democratic movement, anti-apartheid on the other side. And they didn't talk to one another. And so one of the insights was that perhaps business could come in and play a role. And over a period of three years, we started out, and this is part of the lessons that we learned, and it seems to me some of the things that you've also implemented, we started out with um, what I would call change mavericks. I'm going to use what I call the CMs of change, which we unpacked out of some of the, the lessons we learned. The change mavericks to start off with were three or four business leaders. One of them was charged by the president uh, with a presidential commission of inquiry, which led him to be fired from his role. And he was the CEO of one of the top three banks in the country. So, so there were certain sacrifices. But what happened is this small group, three, four people, uh, started slowly growing. And over a period of about a year, we had 12 members. Uh, it took that long because it was, and, uh, it was viewed as very, very antagonistic to, um, to take a position. And, and you mentioned the, the issues around position. And what the mass democratic movement was saying to us is that if you don't take a position, we've got nothing to talk to you about. If you want to be pragmatic, forget it. Out of that grew through uh, collaboration with the the mass democratic movement, um, which included people in the ANC that were in exile. Many of the leaders were in hiding on the run. It meant that business leaders, uh, in effect, had to break the law in order to meet with the representatives of the mass democratic movement. After about two years of this, we managed to get 40 business leaders and 40 representatives of the mass democratic movement into uh, one room. And there, over a period of three days, we established a movement. And I think this is a very, very vital thing. And when I hear you talking about uh, the Private Council uh, for Sustainable Peace, uh, I hear bells ringing of a movement. And, and I'd like to put together two things that I've heard coming from you. Number one is, you've got to take in a position. Number two is, you'd better have a movement. Because the movement needs to be able to grow. So out of the, the change mavericks, we got what we call a, a creative minority, a very small group of people, but they were able to make their voices heard. And then suddenly going from four people to 12 people, 
Eight months later, we had 120. And 120 CEOs, and they were all CEOs. This was one of the key issues around membership of consultative movement, consultative business movement. You had to be the CEO of the company. We targeted the uh, sort of top 500 companies. So 20% of the top 500 isn't bad. We also were looking at people whose voices could be heard and would be heard. And within a year, having achieved the 120 so uh, business leaders, we then got to what we call a critical mass. Uh, at the peak, we had around about 500 business leaders, uh, now ranging from corporates, uh, very large, the type of companies that you represent, through to medium-sized businesses scattered throughout the country. There's one thing that I've got to learn about Colombia that I frankly don't have an answer for. And that is that South Africa's got a very well-developed infrastructure. Uh, we have five to six major urban areas, cities, but uh, there, there are really good roads and really good railway lines and, and you can get to places uh, without donkeys. Uh, so, so I think that's a very, very big difference uh, in, in your country and, and ours, is that we were able to, to have connectivity. There would be times when in any given week there would have been more than 5,000 uh, managers meeting with equivalent numbers of people from the mass democratic movement. And this is for me one of the most important lessons. We got people to know one another by name relationships were created. Uh, people started seeing one another not as the enemy but as someone who also had concerns, someone who also had children, someone who also had suffered. Uh, and, and that really built this network. CBM, Consultative Business Movement, went on to become the secretariat for our national negotiations. So when you bring 100 to 500 CEOs together uh, several hundreds of managers. In that process, one of the things that business did, and, and I haven't heard that, but maybe that's something that uh, is also occurring, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people inside business participated in dialogue sessions. Where this is one of the things, of course, in my country, I don't know yours well enough, but business brings together the community. It brings together the working class the managerial class, the, 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 uh, the lower paid people, the highly paid people. It, it is a small bit of the melting pot. And uh, dozens and dozens of companies use that in order to create a dialogue between black and white, between capitalist and socialist. And, and so a, a convergence grew out of that. But let me complete by making Comments that occurred in the 1980s uh, into the early 1990s. Uh, CBM became the, the Secretariat for Negotiations. And then my sadness is that I've learned that business uh, operates as pragmatism. If there's not a burning platform, then business loses its interest. Uh, the one thing where I think we made a very big mistake is that we saw the peace process for us, the constitutional negotiations, as the achievement. It wasn't the achievement, it was the springboard. And so what we have in our country at this stage, we've got one of the most uh, progressive constitutions in the world. Uh, since 1994, we've had peaceful negotiations every five years, and we've got a, an economy that hasn't been transformed. So, so I think the key thing here with the historic uh, threshold that, that Colombia has crossed, a message that I would take out of my own country, we have lost 20 years of potential progress because we transformed the political system with uh, great inputs from business. We went from a civil war to a peace process and then we took the foot off the pedal. And business and government didn't engage adequately to create a socio-economic structure which would be able to support a very uh, uh, young democracy. But I have to end with one of my big-time leadership quotes or lessons. And, uh, and 
both of, uh, both of you have uh, commented uh, on it already, Sylvia and, and Antonia. During this time, um, on the mass democratic movement side, the anti-apartheid movement, there were some amazing leaders, Nelson Mandela, everybody's heard of. Uh, he was one of several hundred uh, on the mass democratic movement side. And one of the peak <coughs> leaders was a woman called Albertina Sasulu, and she embodied the spirit uh, that I think got us through that. Uh, I was meeting with some of the radical right-wing um, uh, white supremacists, and they said uh, they would meet with me in secret, and I went to Albertina, who was one of the, the, the most influential leaders uh, of the time woman in her late 60s, early 70s at that stage. And I asked her, should I meet with this group of white supremacists? they like the Ku Klux Klan, um, literally. They, they tortured people to death because of they simply were a different race. And uh, I asked her, shall I meet with them? And this is one of the reasons we got through our own process without any hesitation. She said to me, but my son, you've got no choice. You may hate what they stand for, but you may never hate them. It's only by loving them that we'll get into the future. And, and for me, that's one of the things that business and society had to do. We had to be able to look past why we didn't trust one another. Uh, unfortunately, we've lost 20 years. We now need to rebuild some of those relationships. I don't know whether the crisis is big enough. I think it will be. But uh, that would be a caution that I would put to Colombia is don't lose the momentum and you have to get into the socio-economic transformation as soon as possible because democracy cannot succeed without delivery. I think that's probably a joint. Thank you. I just wanted to talk after Christo because we had the opportunity to, uh, to uh, exchange ideas yesterday. And I thought that uh, you have a very compelling uh, story to tell about uh, uh, how important it is uh, uh, to have a, like, a, a unified vision uh, among the, the business uh, uh, community about uh, what is this all about. And I, will, and I want to take the, the first, uh, one of the first things that uh, Sergio Jaramillo said uh, in his presentation, because I think that this is the key point uh, uh, on what we have to work together and, uh, and uh, what the business community and this, uh, and hopefully this council, uh, private council on, uh, on uh, sustainable peace will work more more oh, m more than in uh, uh, following the implementation first of all we have to have a common vision a common vision of what is this peace process about and uh, and that is what we are divided in colombia that is why we are so divided in colombia because we for many the peace process is to defeat the farc is to end the FARC and that's it. We have done that for many years in Colombia. We have demobilized today more than 50,000 combatants in Colombia. But we haven't changed conditions. We haven't changed conditions in, a, in the periphery of Colombia. And, about, and when I talk about conditions, I'm not just talking about economic conditions, which are key, but these are political conditions and yes, as Antonio said, institutional conditions. Our institutions in those, in those areas simply don't work. So yes, we need to have a common view uh, of what is the task we have uh, before us and what is that we, and what is this peace a process all about. It is not about demobilizing the FARC. That is very important, yes. But that is a tiny, tiny part of, uh, of, the, of the task we have before us. 
So, um, talking about uh, common visions and uh, and what are the problems we have uh, uh, in our periphery, and Ana Maria gave us some very compelling, uh, very compelling uh, figures about uh, about the inequalities and the gaps we have uh, uh, in those areas. Uh, one of the one of the critical issues that I think that we have to uh, to bring up a common vision is about the development model. I think that there is no doubt uh, in Colombia, and maybe uh, maybe the the, the left uh, movements in Colombia, uh, yes, they are against capitalism, and and yes, that is that is that is true. That is true. But I think that that most of Colombians believe in private, in the importance of the private sector to generate welfare and uh, to uh, generate employment and development for the country. I think that, that this is, I, I think that th that is bottom line and I don't think that that is, there is no question about, about a, a free market and, a, and, and freedom of uh, of uh, for the for the business uh, for the business sector but what i think is that that the model that the the how do you what what is the purpose of generating um, that the question is what is the purpose of uh, of generating uh, um, and and accumulating um, resources is how do you distribute those resources in well-being, well-being for the people, and how you do it in a, in a manner that is a, that is a, 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 that is good for the environment. So these are this is nothing new. These are the contemporary uh, discussions that are already uh, in in the in the world of the of the development uh, uh, discussions. So, but I think that we really need to come to uh, uh, a consensus within and, and, to, and to open a discussion within the companies and within the private sector about how we do business and how do we distribute uh, uh, the, the the, the, the earnings of the of uh, of uh, of the business. So uh, yes, uh, it is important to follow the implementation. It is very important. But before that, we really have to begin to have a different uh, a, a discussion, an internal discussion about uh, about these uh, these issues, and and really understand why in these areas of Colombia, it hasn't been possible to do development more in a legal way. So uh, I will, I, this is more a call for action. Uh, and, uh, and I really, and I, I'm really very happy that uh, for this initiative of uh, of the council of the private council, uh, I really think uh, these are baby steps, <laughs> but needed baby steps at this uh, at this moment. And I hope that this will be a scenario to begin this this this, uh, this discussion, not only about uh, what is. Uh, we are going to do uh, in the implementation and the day-to-day -day implementation, which is, which is key, but also how, what is the common view we have for our country and for the development of the peripheral areas in, uh, in Colombia.
we need to reduce inequalities, we need to improve the opportunities for all the people in, in Colombia, so please go ahead. Um, sometimes you have to um, take a look at history and try to understand where you are. And the French and the Brit and the Germans fought for 300 years. And uh, when the Union was established in the 50s, we really had two members. It was France and, and Germany. Uh, now they're so um, interconnected that it's also impossible to think about uh, a rupture among them. And I think the same case. Uh, the economic conditions and the, the if we are able to establish um, good institutional rural as we were talking before um, uh, processes and companies and people to, to that break away from the cultural um, mind that also Sergio was talking about that the countryside is bad is poor uh, we don't want to think about it people have bad, bad memories and we can build an, uh, an intelligent institutionality, uh, economic institutionality, and other institutionality around it, and we are up to that process uh, diligently. Um, I'm sure in a decade we'll start seeing a difference, or half a decade, uh, but at least a decade we'll start seeing a difference. Colombia is the third or fourth uh, largest um, uh, unconquered agricultural frontier in the world. Brazil, um, uh, Ukraine, and I think maybe uh, some other country, um, for the 50, for the 10 or, or 9 billion people we're going to have in, in 30 years. Um, so a lot of, uh, we let a lot of food come out of Colombia, and we don't have the, the mentality and the process and um, to be able to, to, to take that land that is available there and produce all that food and, uh, and, and, and help the process of, of reducing the, the, um, the poverty in those, in those rural areas. Um, I, I, by the way, FARC will do politics on their, on their traditional socialist ideas. Timochenko, when they signed the the, the agreement in Cartagena said we are not defeated we will maintain our ideas so they will the, the political platform will be socialism populism so at the end of the day uh, even, even though the, the all that you have tried people have tried to create it to oppose to capitalism is a, is a terrible fail uh, socialism of 21st century is a very pathetic uh, disaster uh, I even though we have to help to demonstrate that liberal democracy works better for people than any other system and we know what to do we know we know what is to be done for a country to achieve better economic indicators and social indicators the difficulty is do that in a democracy because we are plenty of examples of achievements in countries like China, in Sing Singapore, but they do not apply to our case. We have a very imperfect democracy, but demo democracy at the end of the day. So I think that uh, that is the challenge, and uh, I in that order of ideas, we need to build a more effective state, and especially, and this is uh, contained in a very interesting fifth document conducted by Maria Victoria, we need to review our political order. The model of decentralization in Colombia is not working well because we haven't been able to build local capabilities. And we always mention that the peace is going to be in the regions. Peace process have to be worked in the regions. However, if we do not have local capabilities, we can have a lot of broken promises. Our expectations cannot be fulfilled. We need to improve politics. That's very important. We had a very good example now. We knew that we needed a tax reform. And we knew what kind of tax reform we needed in order to 
close gaps between poor and rich people. However, what finally ended up being the tax reform was pretty different from what we wanted. What's the difference in between? Democracy, if you want to put it away, discussion, group of interest, uh, you know, the art of the possible. That's why I think that, and that might be uh, some uh, uh, kind of a dream, uh, I think that we need pact. I, in modern democracies, we need to have pacts because discussion is part of the democracy, as Mill said, but you need to reach certain agreements on basic things to nurture uh, and push, let us say, push uh, economic growth and, uh, and, and social uh, welfare. I, that's why I think this is a good opportunity because if we are demonstrate that we can build an effective state that has the monopoly of law and order in these regions, we could copy maybe that scheme to the other parts of the state that are not working very well beginning for with the centralization uh, uh, scheme that we have, it's not working well. Well, I think they've said most of, of, of the important things around this. I think that we cannot forget that we in the private sector need people to buy our things. We need people to have money. We need people that move the economy. We need people that we can trust working with us. We need capabilities, as Antonio says. So the private sector is the most interested in that all the things of economic development goes well, because in a poor country, you will not do good business. And the other thing that is a very good thing, uh, um, you can do good business. I, <laughs> I think you can do good business, but not <coughs> uh, grow the way you want to grow and have the competitiveness you want to have. And the other thing I was going to say is uh, that moreover, what, what, what they just said, I think there is something missing in Colombia, which is very important. And I think that uh, this week was like um, Maria Victoria said, baby steps on, on that path, which is uh, corruption, which is a war against corruption. And if you have corruption in the central government, you have a lot of corruption outside the central government. I think we have had uh, very good things uh, that have go through in, in, in the central government, but as all the problems outside the central, uh, we have a lot of problems and a lot of challenges that we have to deal uh, about ethical behavior, both in the private sector and the government. Um, so it, it seems very crucial for your companies to be to have a position on the peace deal not only because you are giant companies in Colombia but because also you manufacture your goods and have um, branches in parts of the country that are not just its most urban areas and I'm wondering how you think industries such as the tech industry and startups with technology, which I understand is becoming a very large part of Colombian industry, how those very urban-rooted companies that don't necessarily have reasons to um, be involved in more rural areas of the country, how those industries can be motivated to um, take part in the impl Im implementation of the peace deal. Is there any other questions, maybe, so we can collect a few and then... Um, I would just be interested to hear a little bit about how the private sector is gonna address sort of the issue of the Gini coefficient, um, and especially the issue of land being held sort of by 43% the top one percent and see what the private sector role would be in that. Thank you very much for um, 
for your words and for sharing with us a lot of very interesting uh, <coughs> opinions regarding this. I had a question regarding more of the implicit uh, implications of having, uh, let's say, in the case of Promigas, uh, people from the FARC uh, working there. Of course, uh, not in terms of the individuals, but in terms of uh, who they are as a group. Because it seems to me somewhat contradictory to have a member of the FARC guerrilla, um, a former member of the FARC guerrilla, working in a private firm. Uh, and then um, seeing how most of the proposals that we've heard here are to include all of these people into the economy uh, when they, to some extent, are opposed to how the system works. Uh, maybe look, know a little bit more about how, how this, uh, let's say, conflict of interest plays, plays about. The last one, I, uh, that is already happening. Uh, in the reintegration agency, uh, we have numbers of people uh, that uh, have been uh, through the process even before the Havana. Uh, some, Maria Victoria, is 50,000 people has reintegrated. So they're already working in the, in the, in the system. Uh, I don't think that is the solution uh, because that could count for, you know, uh, uh, yeah, something like that. But is is the message to say uh, we can we can open our companies if you want to if you want to do that. The first thing that we have to understand is what do they want to do. What do they like to do? They can they they want to live in the cities, and you have you know as many. Uh, decisions of, of people you have. So it, it's a matter of giving them the capabilities to do what they value at the end of the day. You know, capabilities as freedom. It's the concept of capabilities of freedom. Uh, but I want to tell you that uh, we went to Havana and we spent like five hours with them, Carlos, and, and we talked about this. We had a very frank conversation we were a group of eight entrepreneurs, and we had a very open and frank and crude discussion with the Secretariado de la FARC, uh, telling them you know, what we thought, understanding that we were taking, uh, you want to put it, a chance, supporting them, <laughs> even though it was not popular, because there are a lot of uh, uh, scars, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, and not too many people is willing to forgive. So we told them clearly, we are here, and we support this, but you have to help us to make this possible. And we don't believe in the Venezuelan model, and we don't believe in this, and I mean, that was very clear. After we left Havana, we, we thought that they kind of understand what the whole thing is all about. And uh, even if they don't like, they have to understand that uh, the 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 the, wor the least the, the the system that that works more or less is the, is the market economy, and, and it, it's not in our case that they in the, our solar energy project that they work for us, but that we join effort with them. They they're gonna have like a cooperativas or something like that. cooperativas in English? They have to have a, a collective associations, so our companies can have joint ventures with their association. They, they still have that notion of collective, but uh, um, <coughs> I just have to respect that. I, I would like to add, uh, where are you from? Oh. <laughs> that too. Um, I just wanted to add that there are two kinds of people in the guerrilla. Well, well a lot of kinds, but, but mostly two. The ones that are on top and are the military leaders but the rest is a very big army of people, and many of those people are not there because they believe in this uh, the thing. They just were there because many of them did not have an option. They were taken from their families when they were just kids, or they didn't have work, they didn't have anything else to do, and that was the only economic option they had. So it is not necessarily 
that they believe in other system. They just believe in earning something for their families. And my experience with the people that have been working with Erbel is, is really marvelous, I have to say that. From all the people that I've had, I only have one person who left, and the others are the best workers that you can find in the service stations. They are so thankful and they are so committed because that was the second opportunity they had in their lives for really having a work for their families. So, so we have to remember that. There are like two kind of people inside. Yeah. Can I, can I ask your, um, get your question, Jura? Um, this morning at MIT, I was um, invited to a little network or, or workshop of virtual rea reality. And uh, I've seen the process, but um, we try to think about to applying it. Um, maybe it's too complex what we're thinking, but we need farms that are, that are much more productive than they are. Um, but just walking through a farm in virtual reality with the spec uh, specifications that you need to have ideally, or at least, uh, not ideally, but medium terms, uh, is very different from being talked about or, or um, being shown in a video. Because farmers, I mean, you need to touch, you need to see, always not, uh, <laughs> virtually doesn't touch, but touch with your eyes, uh, the, the grass and how the grass grows and the kind of cow, and those, those kind of things uh, could be very interesting for these farmers. Um, that's what the reason I, I went there. The other reason is um, in all the biotechnology that is coming out, what is the kind of cows that can um, be sort of designed for these areas um, and how cheaply can we reproduce them to give them massively to these farmers that have land and uh, unemployment workforce? Because they have the two things, but they don't have cows, they don't have the, the, the know-how. They don't have the the um, the grass they had to have, uh, the far the milking, and uh, those those just two examples of things you could do, and uh, to radically increase the productivity, radically in the sense that um, what happened in Macarena is that many of these farmers, when because they didn't have the purchase guarantee of the milk, uh, they just didn't produce the milk. But most of the cases, they doubled the production. In six months, I mean, this is a hundred, hundred percent increasing productivity in six months. How many of us could do that? Um, read a double papers, produce double papers <laughs> in six months, or um, very hard. But with those other um, inputs, I'm sure the the impact could be gigantic. But I, I don't want to forget your question. Uh, uh, the Gini issue in Colombia. Uh, supposedly, we have two, two, you know, two ways to close the Gini. Uh, tax and uh, social investment. Tax does nothing, nothing. Gini before tax and Gini after tax in Colombia exactly the same. So you're doing nothing with tax, which you should do. At least reduce, I don't know, according to experts, she's an expert, five, six points. And social investment, which accounts for 12% of GDP, only close two or three points of Gini. Why? Because it's not well focalized. It's been, uh, not use uh, uh, properly. So we need to reform how we focus the so social investment we need. And this uh, uh, leads me to a sentence of Angus Deaton, is capitalism by far has a better path than socialism, but capitalism needs to be domesticated. The way to domesticate it is through a progressive tax reform, which we don't have yet, and focusing social investment where it's requirement. Uh, the land, something like, I don't know, correct me, two million, three million of hectares should, are gonna be awarded to small farmers. So that uh, that's part of the of the process and it's very important because supposedly the origin of the, of the conflict is, is the land. Uh, but but for, for you, the uh, Spanish, Spanish speaking people, I recommend you uh, to read the book of Professor Jorge Giraldo Ideas en La Paz. It's a, it's a very, it's a different view of the conflict. And he, uh, he reviews in the last 50 years what political options uh, FARC had. And it's very interesting. Jorge Giraldo, Ideas, Ideas en la Guerra. Ideas en la Guerra. Ideas in War. You read it. Yeah, good. You like it? 
Interesting. May, may I add something? Different, different vision from the traditional vision that we receive. Okay. May I add something about the, the genie and, and, the, and the land, which was something uh, that was brought in. Um, I'm sure there is a lot of effort to be done in terms of land distribution, although that was the main points that came out uh, with the no uh, on the referendum. And that was the things that were really clear to be specified and the things that were changed. Uh, but the, uh, the question that was asked to, to say how to meet you, and that people, because uh, people were saying there was, we lived about rumors with all, with all this five years. And people said, well, no, this is really going to be a, a, a land reform worse than Venezuela. It wasn't, it wasn't that way, but it was really clear out that the land light rights wouldn't be taken. But the other thing that happens with the, with the performers is that uh, even though the productivity is high, probably higher than the big farms uh, for studies that I've seen, um, the productivity increases, increases should be much more higher, much, much higher. Um, I, when I did my thesis uh, many years ago about Colombian, yeah, many years ago, but, but had 200 years ago, um, I interviewed President Diaz Estrepo, who um, had done the, uh, yes, um, the land reform in the 60s. And he was also underlining that you do have land reform, sure. But if you don't do the inputs on the land, if you don't get the credit, if you don't get the know-how, if you don't get the, the inputs on, on, uh, on, system, on assistance, uh, technical assistance, if you don't get the, the, the seeds and the fertilizers, you might as well not do the land reform. So it's um, a land reform without those things is a car with only two wheels. You need the other four, to the other two wheel, uh, four wheels, the other two wheels to have a car. Challenges in Colombia, as you see, we are just starting. And thank you, Professor Shapiro, for allowing us to discuss these issues. I think it's important for the country to do it. Okay. And it's important to go out in the country to talk more, more frankly about it. So we will have a reception in the second floor. You are all invited. Uh, and feel free to come. And thank you very much again.